25th anniversary of uh, our church in Waco, Texas, which is Antioch, Waco. So can we celebrate that tremendous accomplishment? And so uh, many of you may not know this, but I'll tell just a little bit about our movement. We have over 80 uh, international teams, and we also have about almost 50 church plants in the U.S., and this whole Antioch movement came out of a move of God where a group of college students decided to give Jesus the absolute yes. How powerful is that? Now, some of you may be like me, but my first uh, hearing about Waco, Texas was David Koresh. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Y'all remember that? I just, I just did an age split right in the room right there. They're like, David, who? Watch a documentary, y'all. You, you'll figure it out after a while. But it's a, it was a national uh, event that took place in Waco. So whenever you mention Waco, Texas, uh, you know, hear about the ATF and what went on with this cult that was in Waco. But now when you talk about Waco, if you go down to Waco, there's a piece that rests on the city. And uh, actually, one of the couples that got raised up out of Antioch, Waco, uh, was Chip and Joanna Gaines. Uh, they were in a small group with the former pastors here at, at this church. And uh, back in the day, they prophesied and spoke God's thoughts over Waco when it had a bad reputation. And now Waco is one of the top tourist sites in the nation. Do you see what the church can do? <laughs> When God's people show up and begin to pray and to believe God and not stay in the four walls of the church. Let's give God a hand for 25 years for Jimmy and Laura Seibert uh, and all of the faithful ones who have been doing God's work uh, in Texas. So now it's beautiful to see uh, churches that have been planted out of Waco and then even churches that have been planted out of the churches that have been planted and for those of you who are wondering, well, who are you? What, what is this church all about? Today, you'll get to hear all about who we are. We are here to see God's purposes and plans planted all throughout the country and all throughout the nations. Uh, we want to help create a space where everybody can discover who am I and what is my assignment. We want you to live in the city where you live because you know you're on assignment with Jesus. We want you to be able to wake up and when you go to work or wherever you are putting your hands to stay busy, we want you to have that satisfaction that I am doing and I am in the will of God. We want to see you having victory over challenges because the world that we live in right now, we face challenges. It's, it's a part of it. And that's why we gather together uh, because we are the church and the scriptures call us the pillar and the ground of truth. So if you would, I want to pray. And we're going to jump into this word and get back to this word that we just uh, spoke together. Father, we thank you this morning. So many lives and so many families are gathered. Lord, we're here on one accord just to say, let your kingdom come and let your will be done in every single life in this room. Father, would you prevail so that every person in this room knows that you see them, you know them, and would you open every ear to hear your calling, your assignment? And Father God, would you cause the church to reach far outside of the four walls and to impact every place where their feet go and that their families would be transformed, God, and that brokenness, God, would be healed, that sicknesses would be removed, that crooked places would be made straight and rough places made smooth. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. I believe what I'm sharing with you today because I've had the privilege for so many years to see the power of the good news reach people's lives. I don't know what kind of situation you're, you are in, in in your own life or where your family is, but the introduction of the gospel or the good news is a new start. And not only is it a new start for us, those who have been in Christ, there are new starts that continue to take place the more we learn about Christ. We read Isaiah chapter 40, and I want to go back to it. Uh, the, 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 the scripture says in Psalm chapter 1, to meditate on the word day and night. And that we would be like trees 
planted by the rivers of water that give their fruit in their seasons, whose leaves will not wither, and whatever they do will prosper. Joshua 1 also says to meditate on the word. It says this book of the law will not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate on it day and night. Then he said, then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Allow God's word to come in to shift our thinking because if you don't have a, an intentional set of thoughts, the culture has a set of thoughts waiting for you. And many people rise and they say, I'm an independent thinker. Nope. <laughs> uh, so many thoughts are just given to us. And so the scripture says that uh, here's what we want you to do. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter four, or chapter six, but it says, put the word up in your house, uh, put it on the walls, put it on the doorposts and on the lentils. He said, talk about it when you walk in the way. Talk about it when you sit in your house. God, why do we put the word everywhere? He said, because it doesn't just activate by just listening. Meditation is actually, some people call it muttering. So you just take the verse and you say, I'm a tree. I am a tree. I am unshakable. The next storm that comes in my life it will show that I am rooted in Christ. Rains may hit me, storms may hit me, floods may come, but I am a tree. That's what you do. Some people are like, I don't know how someone can pray for so long. Well, you're not just sitting there asking questions. Part of it is meditating on his word. Part of it is what they call just speaking or confession. That's speaking the same as the truth. So you begin to speak it over and over and over again. And you put, as we say, put skin on it because John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, and the word of God was made flesh and it came to dwell among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Let the word get in you, but then meditate on it so it makes sense to you. Let it make sense to you. So that's what we're going to do. Amen. Isaiah 40 and verse 3 says, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Amen. Everybody say clear the way. Yeah, y'all didn't get it. Y'all didn't get it. Come on, mamas. Say clean up your room. <laughs> now y'all know what he was trying to say. Amen. We, we got guests coming over here. Amen. Clear the way. <laughs> That's why we meditate on the word. So now, now that makes sense. We're preparing for the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. How should we prepare our houses? Amen. He said, I want you to clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. I'm reading because I did most of my Bible memorization as a child in King James, so I have to read it when it's a different translation. <laughs> Bring down the mountains, exalt every valley, make the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth. Again, you want to meditate on it so it makes some sense. Mountains brought down. That stuff that's a big deal to you, it ain't a big deal. Help me, somebody. <laughs> and the stuff that you're not paying attention to, it's a big deal. Now put more attention to it. Now does it make sense, amen? The crooked things, you know it's crooked. Stop acting like it's not crooked. Stop acting like you didn't see it in the word. He said, make that stuff straight. Straighten it out. God, I need help. No, you don't. You need to make a decision. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. God's not going to open up the heavens, shine a light down, put a hook in your nose, and drag you out of that sin. You got to say no. Ah. Ah. We're just meditating on the word this morning. I'm, I'm just not going to preach this morning. We're just going to meditate on it. Make that crooked stuff straight. 
Make that rough stuff smooth. How many times have you walked away and known it was your anger? It was your bitterness. You're the storm in the room, but you keep deflecting it on somebody else. Make the rough places smooth. God is coming. Amen? Said, you do that. John the Baptist comes declaring, repent. Turn around because Jesus is coming. His goodness is looking for a place prepared for him. Can you say amen to it? Then, can you say then? Verse 5, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. He said there's something about the glory of God and the beauty of who he is and of his story that will rest on your life and everyone will see it. Everybody will see it. Some of you are frustrated because you're like, my family won't listen to me. I share the good news with people on my job. They don't listen to me. Relax. They see you. <laughs> it's just that when we are in sin, we have an incredible way of not seeing what we see. How many have been in there before? I know I was. I thank God for Christ coming to me. And that's why, you know, some people are like, you know, I was saved. I was doing drugs and God set me free. I was sleeping around and God set me free. We all have our different testimonies. And some of you in here think that you're too far gone for Jesus, but, but we're all in here, trust me. And some of us were raised in the church and that, that was my story. I was right in the church and still just as lying and full of lust as anybody else. And that's why I thank God even more for my story. I had the word. I knew the truth. And unfortunately, it took a suicide, a friend committing suicide, before it shook me out of my stupor. Before I finally wrestled with my own fear of man. Before I finally just said, okay, I'm hearing these things. And even when the preacher would preach, I'm telling you, he could say stuff, but it was like deep in my heart. I knew God was real. You didn't have to explain it to me. Deep in my heart, I was aware of that part that God has placed in every human being that knows God is real and that knows that when that, that name of Jesus is mentioned, there's something right about that name. It's in their family. It is in there. So why do we have the church? The Bible says that the church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. God has a witness in the earth to give every human being the opportunity to be free. I know turmoil is hard and many of us are hard in hard situations, but Jesus has come to set us free. And you're like, well, I try to share this with other people. Well, just guess what? There will come a time where they will see but we're called to be those witnesses. But then God gives us the opportunity ourselves to make the high places low, the valleys exalted, the crooked places straight, and the rough places smooth. I want to share today not just about the purpose of this church, but just the purpose of the church at large. And I want to share a couple of things that might be unique about this house and part of the reason why I love it. I love this house because I always wanted my children to grow up in an environment where they are around people that are hungry for God. I wanted them to be provoked. I wanted them to be around seniors and, and gray hairs and people with stories that still love God, still lift their hands, still get excited when the name of Jesus is mentioned. That's where I wanted my children to be. And I'm going to tell you the wisdom and the brilliance of the church is just amazing. Create a space where you can come together with multiple generations with a clear purpose. Get in the word constantly. It's just, it's just brilliant. Don't just live through life. Think. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Look at somebody and tell them, would you think? Come on, tell somebody. <laughs> don't, don't get punched now. If that's your mama, it don't, don't say it with that tone. Okay. 
but he tells us to think. Come now, let us reason together. Think this thing through. Dig down and hit the gold of the good news of the gospel of Christ, that this thing is amazing when we see what God has done. The reason I started in Isaiah chapter 49 is because I simply want to marry the purpose of the church with how it was brought coming out of the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, you will find 66 chapters. And just like you have 66 books of the Bible, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. College students, how's my math? All right, thank you. And so when we get to chapter 40, in essence, it's like stepping into the New Testament, right? 39 chapters before starts with the 40th chapter. And here in the 40th chapter, we hear a phrase that will sound familiar. The phrase is the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness. Now turn to Mark chapter 1, because the person that was making that declaration was the person that we know as John the Baptist. He wasn't a Pentecostal. He was a Baptist. It, uh, I'm sorry, y'all. There's a little truth to that, but um, just have to keep y'all, make sure y'all are paying attention. But he had a clear assignment to baptize, to preach repentance, to make a declaration, and to prepare the way for the Lord. Mark chapter 1 says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. I need to make a side comment right here that God just dropped on my heart. Some of you are going after things, but sometimes you move too fast and you don't let God set it up. Just for some of you who are like, are we going through this Sunday school lesson this morning? Yes, we are. Because the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. And today the truth is being um, kind of challenged. And people are saying that there are other ways to, to heaven and there's, there are other ways to the Father. And Jesus said, I am the way. And as a matter of fact, um, with the, his life being threatened, Peter said, there is salvation in no other and no other, for there is no other name under heaven through which we must be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. Family, there is nobody else that can let you in to eternal life. Nobody. Muhammad can't do it. When I share the good news with Muslims, they are people too. And you don't have to be afraid. They're people, too, who have lives and families and everything. When I share with them, I just ask one question. So when you die, are you sure that you will be received into heaven? Have you been righteous enough? I don't know. Well, that's the good news that I like to share because we know we can't be righteous enough. And we know he shed his blood for us. And we know his blood was pure and he never sinned and he was the lamb slain for us. That's the good news. You should think about the fact that he did come and even your scriptures talk about him. Ours does not talk about your prophet. Because there is only one name through which you must be saved. Only one. It's not Buddha. Probably some neat philosophies you might find. And people are like, well, then why do we see all this morality that's the same? Because God has placed in man a moral code. So even if you were making up a religion, you might say, hey, don't steal from each other, guys. Hey, you shouldn't kill each other, people. That's a good idea, don't you think? Hey, everybody, you probably shouldn't sleep around. That's a good idea. Well, well hey. You know, I like women. Okay, so then we're, we're going to, you can marry 10 women. How about that? You always see something veer off of righteousness. Do you hear what I'm saying? So people were like, well, if the code of morality is the same, then, 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 why, then why are you Christians only saying that there's one way? Because see, all of the prophets that you're talking about, they died. 
and only one rose again. Only one. And this is the good news that we share. This is the good news that we say yes to, Lord, wherever you want to send us and however you want to use us. Regardless of my degree, whatever job I need to take, wherever I need to place myself, I'm thinking about the Moravian movement, which had so much to do with the gospel being spread even through America because uh, John Wesley ran into one of the Moravians on a ship, I think the story goes, and he was moved by them before the Methodist movement. And John Wesley, they were preachers, they were itinerant preachers, and they went everywhere sharing the good news, but they had ran into a Moravian. And these, this group of people had prayed 24-7 for 100 years straight. And two of their missionaries saw that there were slaves that did not have the gospel. And they said, went and sold themselves as slaves so that they could share the gospels with the slaves. That's the family we're in, y'all. People who say that the value of this good news is greater than life. The value of this good news is more than a human being can pay for. You cannot purchase this gospel with silver and gold. It is our privilege to lay our lives down and serve him. This good news is more than we can put in human words to think that man sinned against God and God's response was to send his son to die on a cross and be crucified by the hands of men, the most brutal death a human being could come up with, rise from the dead to receive us by us simply saying yes, that is mind-blowing. Because he has clearly said he does not need us. He exists without us, but God is love. That's why true love is when someone lays their life down for you. He has defined it for us. So why the church? Why do the people of God say yes to what he says? Because he knows where there are those who have never heard the good news before. He knows where there are families and individuals whose hearts have been so broken and they have been done wrong. And they have been done wrong by people they should have trusted. He knows where our brokenness is, yet he says, can I find my children who will say yes to me and take this good news into that city, take this good news into that nation, take this good news into that place? Can I finally preach a political message for you? Maybe I should tell you who to vote for. How about that? Try not to have a church split. Tell you who to vote for. Vote for the church. Regardless of who steps in the White House in January, there's one big question. Will God's people rise? God, America is so dark. This country is so dark. Look how bad everything is. And God's like, I'm whispering to my children, but they're busy. They're busy. I'm trying to get their attention, but it's a little hard. Their own kids can't get their attention. And, and they talk to each other on their phone, sitting right next to each other. I'm trying to get their attention. The Spirit of God is going out into the earth. He's no mystery. His love is greater than ours. When you think you care about somebody, you can't imagine how God loves that person. I used to be fearful. I didn't want to invite anybody to church. I was an athlete. I was a leading scorer. That's what I was known for in high school. And now all of a sudden, I have given my life to Jesus, and now I'm supposed to be bold. And so I'm wrestling back and forth with what I want to be known for until I turned 18 and got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I finally got free of the fear of man. How many in here have known the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where it comes upon you and the boldness it drives all of the fear away. Amen? Because how many know the scripture says that perfect love, it casts out all fear. What are you known for? What do you want to be known for? This is our opportunity. The church is to be known for this good news. The story of the gospels is simple. 
is beautiful and it's complete. We see John the Baptist introducing this message with the message of repentance and change and turning around. And, and, and I want to say something. There are bondages and there are choices. God wants us to make choice with him so that he can break the bondage. Did you catch that? Some people think that they have to clean up everything about themselves to come to Christ. God's like, no, you come to Christ and I will clean it up. Because see, once he has the heart, he begins to take the root of all of those wrong things and he kills everything from the root. And that dead thing can't grow in your life anymore when he has your heart. It's all about the heart, friends. It's just all about the heart, friends. He's like, why do you guys have such passionate worship? Why do you get so much into worship? That must just be a bunch of emotions. Sweetheart, you have emotions. You have emotions. When you get angry, you express emotions. When someone does you wrong, you're like, hey, you know, why'd you lie to me? Hey, why'd you talk about me behind somebody's back? You know, there's no emotion, not angry. Oh, okay, let's go grab something to eat. Why did I hear that about me? I heard such and such from so-and-so. You're breathing funny. We're human beings, amen? We worship. There are things that make us joyful and there's things that make us sad. Blessed are they that mourn. We will face pain in life. We will face mourning in life. God said, I want you to face things, but I will be your comforter, amen? So, I want to read... 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I've quoted this to you already, verse 15. This is Paul writing to the church, and he says to the church, first, and I won't go through these verses, but it talks about the standard for leaders. So the leadership standard in the church is high. It is. Don't act up. If you teach the word, if you teach the gospel, the Bible actually says that God will judge us more severely than he does everybody else. And you say, well, wow, that seems mean. He said, no, he's protecting families. And I've shared this with you before. If you want to really understand God's heart and, and read the law in the Old Testament, 623 different laws, if you want to understand it, watch for what God is protecting. That's how you understand him. He's like, well, why was God so mean with adultery? He's protecting children. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He wants a godly seed. And he knows that the best way for any child is to have their two greatest defenders, their father and their mother, in union together. That's why you see the scripture that says God hates divorce. It's not about, he didn't say he hates you. He didn't say he hated you because of your experience or what you went through and it wasn't your fault. That wasn't it. He's saying he hates seeing a child left out in the open under the elements. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you want to understand God in the Old Testament, look for his heart and not just his rules. Same thing when a parent says something to you. I need you to be back by such and such time. Man, why are you always and you make me come in at such and such time? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Or you could see the fact that you're trying to protect me, aren't you? You've seen bad things and you love me more than you love your own life, don't you? So you can either see a bunch of rules when you hear about Jesus, or you can see the heart of the Father when you see Jesus. Don't you love him? There are things that he will just tell you to run away from, figure it out later, and you will thank God that you obeyed. Amen. Has anybody ever been rescued from a scam before because of Jesus? Amen. God is good. Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read a few verses here, and I will not be holding you long today. The gospel is simple, beautiful, powerful, and the question is, will his church love his message, and say yes to his plans. Luke chapter 12. We are stewards of the gospel story, and we are the gospel story. Can you say that with me? We are stewards of the story, and we are the gospel story. Yes. 
Luke chapter 12 and verse 35 says, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Come on, somebody. Stay ready. Stay hot in God. You're like, oh, I keep going lukewarm. Do you know lukewarm is connected to the word vomit? They invited me to a high school uh, chapel one time, and I preached a message called vomit. I had everybody's attention the whole time. But that's what he called it, to live a life that's casual. He says, be hot or cold, make a decision. I think I need to say that out loud for someone in this room right now. It's like you want God to push you to the left or push you to the right or push you into being radical. It doesn't happen that way. You get opportunities. You get opportunities. Some people get an opportunity right here this morning. This is the beginning of the rest of their lives because they see it. And they simply say, the, 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 the ceiling didn't rattle and uh, they didn't see a glory cloud. All they know is that they made the decision to say, God, I want you to have everything in my life. And they walked out with a decision. They made a decision. But where a lot of people rest is in the lukewarm zone. Well, they'll scoot closer here or they'll scoot closer there. They put their right foot in and they'll put their right foot out. They put their shake it all about. Never mind. But they won't make a decision. That's where I was. <laughs> I wouldn't make a decision. I wouldn't make a decision. I just wouldn't make a decision. Until one morning, I walked into Norwalk High School and the halls were scattered because my parents kept me out of the loop. I wasn't allowed to do things everybody else was doing. And I'm thankful because they were protecting me. They wanted to keep me. They were hoping that I would choose the right path. One day I walked in and a friend had killed himself. And then another friend tried it. And then another friend tried it. And I saw the cascade begin to start. And there I had to wrestle with the zone that I sat in as I sat in church repeatedly. I never would have told you I'd be standing in front of a church sharing, doing this. I never would have found myself going into boardrooms and telling you I pray with leaders and government leaders and have laid hands on leaders, me, right. But God had something he wanted to do and the job postings on heaven's wall are vast. And that's why he said, pray for laborers. Pray that people will begin to get out of this lukewarm, maybe one day I'm thinking about it, I might, oh, yeah, I, well, I'm going to church more than I used to. Stop pushing me so much. May the Lord set you free from your indecision because you have no idea what true freedom is. Fearing what people think about you is bondage. You can't smile when you want. You can't say something when you want to say it. You, you're not free. No, you're not. But whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I don't want you coming in here and smiling if you don't feel like it. That's not what the church is. You come in here, frown all you want to. <laughs> Now, we're a little wild in here, y'all. You might have like 10 bottles of oil going down your head, <laughs> people just chasing you around, just like, come on, hold, hold, hold still. Hold still, hold still. Hold still. <laughs> we know it. We, we, we got it. We, we almost got it, y'all. Corner it right over there. <laughs> but that's why we're the church. I'm sorry, I like smiling. I like joy. I like peace. I like going to sleep at night, worn, slap out from doing God's will and not wondering anymore if I'm hot or cold. I like having made a choice, somebody. 
And that's his invitation for all of us. Make a choice. I'm being so scared of folks. If you want to run around down here and do a cartwheel in front of everybody, uh, just don't break your neck. Don't mess the service up. You have to call IMSA because you got too excited, right? You had a rough week. All of a sudden, an intimate area in your life is being attacked. The church gathers around to pray with you. You're not supposed to have to go at it alone. Amen? If you like makeup, just don't use it to cover up your pain. Just be real before God. Fall down before God. Who cares what people think about you? How long do you want to stay in the space of indecision? You say, well, Clarence, you're supposed to be talking about the church. Why did you go to John the Baptist? Because it doesn't start until you decide something. We have an amazing ability to stand right under the truth and be unaffected by it. And the longer we see things and refuse, the harder the heart will get. And you think just because you're in attendance that that's how some big checkbox before God because he, he owes you more understanding about what you went through. He is God. It was man that rebelled. It was us. It was our parents. Do you think God never tried to get them to say yes? Do you think he didn't whisper in their ears like he's whispering in your ears? Yes, he did. Do you think he didn't tell a perfect stranger in the grocery store to come up to them and tell them about the love of God? Of course he did. They said no. It wasn't him that didn't try to bring love and peace and joy into your home too. Oh, he was there. He was there. The church has been fighting darkness for generations since Jesus walked this earth. He's there. He's there. The preaching of the gospel has been on the radio. It's been on the news. Glorious. If you even watch the Olympics, you've got to watch like Sidney McLaughlin. Like, no, I don't care what you say. I'm talking about Jesus. Amen? Yeah, you can look at all the nonsense of the introduction, or you can look at the fact that you got these Olympians declaring the name of Jesus. His name will be heard, amen? His, his story will be told. And we are the bearers of that good news. And, I, and I've got to tell you this. Don't diminish who you are. That's why you want to spend time with God. That's why you want to come to the house of God. You need someone to tell you, you are worth more than you think. I am the result and for those of you who heard, have heard this a thousand times, just check the box because you're going to hear it a thousand more times. I am the result of a man who made a decision to follow Jesus on the July 4th, 1967. I was born in 73. He made a decision to follow Jesus. And he married a young woman who God chose to rescue by planting her in the church, in the house of God. Grabbed my mother out from East St. Louis. Get that one right there. Get her, get her, get her. Oh, she's not going to get get raised with her. I don't care. Her brother was murdered over 60 bucks and found in a trunk of a car. Her sister was trapped in generational poverty to this day. But get that one right there. Get her out of that. Someone say, yes, I know you are, have already raised your children, but I need you to raise one more. I need you to raise one more. Come on, I need you to get Lorraine Hill, Lorraine Stevenson. And then we're going to get this other guy who... Cussing, smoking, fussing, Navy seller, drinking, hanging out and across the river in Illinois all the time. And we're going to bring him the gospel, the good news. And they're 10 years apart, so that's kind of weird in that day. Now she's a daughter of the church from a broken past. When we would go to East St. Louis to visit her family, we might get to see granddad. 
maybe. He was tall. He was long. Can you imagine? <laughs> he was always joking. And he hadn't had a raspy voice like this. And alcohol, you could almost smell it through his skin. And we might see him when we went to visit. Mom and I, are we going to get to see granddaddy? I don't know, baby. Then we get over to great grandmother's house to, that she called mom, and we walk in the house and be like, hey, are we going to get to see grandmother, her mother? I don't know, baby. Every now and then she'd be in the back room recovering from drunkenness. But someone preached the good news and said, if you say yes to Jesus, I will turn your life around. If you say yes to Jesus, I will rescue your children and your generations. If you say yes to Jesus, I will turn things around and kings will come out of your loins. If you say yes to Jesus. I don't know what you think the church is, but we are the carriers and the bearers of this good news that anybody's life can be turned around. Anybody's family can be turned around. Anybody can be used by God. Even if you're not perfect, our family, we fuss, we go back and forth. If you run into a hill, we're a bullet head times bullet head. We are forceful. It's just, it's just part of who we are and God has to humble us real good. But we're chosen. And that's my only invitation for you today. We want to invite you to catch the vision of the church, the whole body of Christ. I don't care what church you go to. And I know some of you may be like, hey, I think this is my family. I've told a handful of people today, they're like, and they're, they're, it's funny, they keep saying that, we think this is home. I'm just like, well, welcome home. And we say that to you, welcome home. But even if you land in one of the other, quote, Sunday school rooms or churches in this city, God bless you. Just get in the ark. Get in the church. Get with the family of God. Throw away your judgmentalness. Amen. I can't stand church people. Well, where are you going to go, huh? Huh? Where, 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 where else is there to go? It's just us redeemed folks who have real past and who have been give, forgiven of real sins. I pray for everyone in this room today. Would you stand and ministry team come forward? I want to make an invitation today because somebody is sitting in indecision and that word pricked your heart and it's time for you to choose to be hot. It's time for you to choose to be hot for the Lord. Clarence, what did you want to be known for? I just enjoyed running through the tunnel and they calling my name. I was double zero. Average seven blocks a game, just in case y'all were asking. <laughs> now I can't even guard my 15-year-old son, but that's another story. But the invitation right now is to come out of indecision. The invitation is that there's someone in your world who might be thinking about ending their lives. Loneliness is at an epidemic. And this whole nation's about to get shaken. It's time to get in the ark family. It's time to be more family than you've ever been before. It's time to jump in your small groups. It's time to call two or three friends and start a prayer meeting at your house. I am not joking with you, family. It's time to turn up the heat and stop being a casual Christian. It's time to say, Lord, right here at my address, in my dorm room, it will be a house of prayer. The only reason we call this church is because we're here. We believe it's a building. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? You are beautiful people. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. When Peter said yes to Jesus, he said, you know, even if I get embarrassed in front of people, I'm going to follow you. Even if I stumble running after you, I'm going to follow you. 
And when, Pete, when Jesus saw that kind of hunger in Peter, he said, I'm going to make you the leader of this church movement. Because it's not your smarts I need, it's your hunger and your heart I need, and you've chosen to give me both. So I'm bringing you as close to me as possible. Some of you have tried to know God through your mentals, and God needs your will. Just yes, Lord. Just yes, Lord. Lord, I, I just feel like I need to bow down before the altar right now. Just yes, Lord. I don't need an invitation. John the Baptist came crying and shouting in the wilderness, and we shout it today right now. Let this be your day of turning around. Some of you, if you just would, would you respond to God? I'm going to take, ask you to take 30 seconds and just respond to the Lord before we worship. Right where you are, a word that you've heard, I want you to just, just to begin to practice praying. Father, we come before you right now. We lift our lives, our futures, our hopes, our expectations, places where we've been hurt or failed. We lift all of that to you right now, Lord God, and say, use our lives, Lord, for your glorious purposes and plans. Lord, make your story come alive through me. Lord God, show me the wonderful things that you say you hide them until we pursue and we seek you, Lord. Open my eyes to your purposes and plans over my life. Come on, someone, open your mouth and ask God yourself for it right now. Come on, somebody. I'll let you go get a burger in just a second, but not now we, we want to take, someone's life will change if you would just follow right now. Come on, just follow, just follow, just follow. God, I want you to have everything. God, I want you to have everything. Someone here, you're dealing with severe anxiety because you always have to control and God is saying it's time to surrender everything. You are tilting your whole household. It's time to surrender everything. If you want to just begin to come forward, the altar is open. And Lord Jesus, we say yes to your will and to your plans. You all, as we begin to sing this song, I'm going to just make a call. If you are in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, it is my responsibility as a minister of the good news of Jesus Christ to tell you you have not been permitted into heaven and you have not been given eternal life. I'm here to tell you right now that Jesus died so that you can say, I am going to receive eternal life. But don't you let anybody lie to you or fool you to think that God sent his son, he hung on a cross for us just to go on our way and reject him. God is offering the best thing he could give and he gave himself, you all. Let today be the day where your life is turned around. So, Lord, we thank you. Now we go without any words or any push. Draw people to yourself for repentance, for renewal, for being filled with your spirit. And we thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name.